Ladies and gentlemen, you have been waiting for it, and here it is today on Tech Yes City. This is the X5675, which is over eight years old now, and is six cores, 12 threads. We managed to clock this up to 4.5 gigahertz and use some triple channel DDR3 memory, which was at 1800 megahertz. Now comparing it against the two brand new options, we have the Ryzen 5 2600 clocked at 4.1 gigahertz on a B350 motherboard, and I decided to use 3200 megahertz DDR4 memory, and then we have the last contender, the i5-8400. Very much a power efficient, sort of brand new latest IPC, best single core performance, but is it going to stack up, considering it can only go up to 2666 with the DDR4 memory, on a H370 motherboard. And of course, for the graphics card, we are using the same GPU across all three different rigs. This is the Galax GTX 1080 Ti. So let's get this comparison underway. So first thing is first, we're going to take a look at the streaming benchmarks. We'll pull that up because a lot of people will ask me to test some streaming benchmark numbers. We're using XSplit, six megabits per second. Now there's two ways you can go about this. And I wasn't the only person in the studio when I was testing these numbers. So people were witnessing what I was talking about. And I may make a dedicated video towards this because streaming is not that intensive if you set it up right. We're using XSplit, we're using the onboard GPU encoder, which literally only takes like a six to 7% hit on the GPU and the CPU feels practically nothing. So this is the option that I do recommend as opposed to using the CPU for encoding, which in this particular benchmark, which is Final Fantasy 15, if we were using the CPU encoding, we saw the CPU cores being stressed a lot more than they otherwise would. And there was a massive stutter halfway through the run. Now let's pull up some games at 1080p and 1440p, first being Far Cry Primal. We see here the X5675 did score a loss in this benchmark. It did fall behind the Ryzen 5 2600, which also fell behind the 8400. And it was in a sort of as expected tandem there. Moving up to 1440p presented the exact same results. Moving over across the CSGO, 1080p, same sort of scenario. We saw the 8400 out in front, followed by the Ryzen 5 2600 followed by the X5675. Moving up to 1440p on this same game with higher graphical settings, we saw the exact same trend continuing. And then we move on to Ashes. This is where things changed up a little bit. Ryzen 5 2600 did score the victory here, coming over to 100 FPS, as opposed to the 8400, which scored second place. And then the X5675 scored third place. And this was the same scenario in 1440p high settings as well. Moving over to Kingdom Come Deliverance, and this is at 1080p where the X5675 managed to score its first victory over the Ryzen 5 2600. I couldn't believe this, and I did promise in the live stream that I'd do some jumping jacks if the X5675 did score a victory either over one of these two brand new variants. It's great success. Moving up to 1440p high settings, however, we did see this trend did change up a little bit, and the Ryzen 5 2600 did score a little bit better than the X5675. So those jumping jacks were only temporary. Now the next game we got up here is Dota 2, and at 1080p low settings, 100% screen scale, we saw pretty much similar results across the board. The 8400 was coming slightly ahead. Uh, it's not jumping jack worthy, of course, as there is a very close run here, and there is a little bit of variance, so I'm not gonna do some jumping jacks for this one, but moving up to 1440p high settings, saw the same trend so Dota 2, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between it. Though moving on to GTA 5, 1080p normal settings, we did see a sizable or a little sizable difference between the X5675 and the Ryzen 5 2600. The 8400 came out ahead by quite a bit, but this is indeed jumping jack worthy. Great. So quite an impressive feat for an eight-year-old CPU. It's scoring a minor victory over one of these brand new variants, which is really surprising. But moving up now to 1440p, we see this trend discombobulate. I think that's the word we're gonna use. And uh, everything sort of returns to normal with the GPU taking a lot more of the strain. Moving over to the next game, we have PUBG, both 1080p and 1440p settings really showed not much of a difference here. It was smooth across all three different rigs. There was nothing between these. If you wanna play PUBG on either three of these machines, you're gonna have a wonderful experience with a 1080 Ti. Also not to mention that this game does have a 144 Hertz cap. So I may actually drop it from further testing in the future. And of course, the last game we're showing here is Final Fantasy 15. We did show it in the streaming benchmarks, 
but of course it's great to sort of get a recap and see that there is no difference. This game does have a 120 hertz cap, however it does utilize all cores and all threads if they are available. So it was impressive to see the scaling on this game and it does utilize those resources. Moving up to 1440p does show it's more GPU bound even at high settings. We can't even dare go to ultra because that'll tank the FPS even more. So we're getting around 100 frames at 1440p, which is great if you've got an ultra wide monitor, but we're testing at 1440p to 560. So we would lose even more frames if we went to ultra wide. Not that that's important for this video. Anyway, moving over to productivity, we have a few different graphs here. Some of the most important to paint a picture, Cinebench, Ryzen 5 2600, scoring number one on both the single threaded and multi-threaded performance, 8400 coming last in the multi-threaded performance, becoming second place in the single threaded, and the, of course the X5675, putting on a very impressive display, scoring over 1000 CB on that multi-threaded test. Moving to V-Ray, sort of a similar trend in the CPU side of things, except the 8400 did beat the X5675 by a little bit. Ryzen 5 2600 did, like, it was blazingly fast, going well ahead of the bell curve on this particular benchmark. But another benchmark we're going through now is the V-Ray GPU side. Now, I don't even know why I run this to begin with. I guess I just drink my cup of coffee or cup of tea and AFK while the benchmark completes itself. But when I get back, I've got the GPU score there. And surprisingly enough, the X5675 shaved off one second. It's got one minute and six seconds versus the others, which got one minute and seven seconds. So I was really surprised to see that it shaved off at one second. Now, the differences being between these two platforms, the big ones, being that this is a PCIe 2.0 versus PCIe 3.0, and also we have uh, DDR3 memory versus DDR4 memory, but whatever the deal, it makes the GPU run just that little bit better in this particular benchmark. Though continuing on with the benchmarks, we've got here Adobe Premiere Pro 4K render file, final render times, the Ryzen 5 2600 scores the victory by quite a bit, then it's followed by the 8400, which is then followed by the X5675. So kind of as expected, Though one thing to take out of this is that you could edit videos on any three of these PCs absolutely fine. Though in the past when I've tested music mixdowns, I have made the tracks around about four to five minutes, which is more realistic. But this time for benchmark purposes, we're gonna go unrealistic, 35 minute track. We saw the differences here. There weren't that big to begin with, but the Ryzen 5 2600 did come out in front and these were all rendering close to 30 times real time render. So. If you need music production, then all three of these rigs will do a phenomenal job, at least in Prozonus Studio One. Anyway, the last benchmark we're pulling up here, 7-zip decompression and compression. I was surprised to see the X5675 coming out quite far ahead of the 8400. Uh, the 8400 did come last here, and then the Ryzen 5 2600 came out in front. So if you're into decompressing and compressing zip files all day, then the Ryzen 5 2600 will be the best option for you. Though, of course, that last benchmark we're going to pull up is one that's actually been heavily requested, and that's power consumption. So all these three rigs overclocked, and you will want to overclock the X5675 because it does have a lot of potential. We can see it's getting over 200 watts on load, which is a little bit scary. I mean, of course, I'm not going to sit here and say that's an amazing thing, uh, but it's 70 watts, or roughly 70 watts in front of the Ryzen 5 2600, which is then uh, actually quite a sizable gap over the 8400. So the 8400 actually, if it's one thing to come out of this, it's very power efficient and for gaming it's very relevant. And the reason being is because you can save money on a power supply as well. You don't have to go out and buy a 650 watt gold rated power supply. You can get away with a 450 watt bronze rated power supply with an 8400 and then couple in a decent GPU, you're home and hose, GTX 1070, whatever. But if you're coupling a GTX 1070 with the X5675, for example, then I would recommend maybe going with a 550 or 650 watt power supply just to be on the safe side. So there's that difference to consider. And also, of course, the power savings that you will save on your power bill if, for instance, you're playing World of Warcraft for eight hours a day. That will add up over time and will save you a little bit of money, not to mention it will make your room a little bit cooler. When it's all said and done, we have here the six cores versus six cores versus six cores with the best GPU available to consumers at the moment. That is the GTX 1080 Ti. And where does this leave my old school favorite CPU and motherboard combination of all time? Well, it actually leaves it in a really good spot because every time I've picked up an X58 motherboard, I've picked it up for an absolute bargain. Now, of course, the X5675, you can pick them up off AliExpress if you want to pay market rates, pick it up for like $40, $50. Uh, they do go down in times in price to like $30 off eBay. I've seen sales for them. So for that money for the CPU itself, 
it's phenomenal value for money. There's no denying that. Not only that, you can go get cheap DDR3 memory, which a lot of people just give away practically with PCs, or they sell on local listings for very cheap. And then you've got yourself the base for a very potent gaming machine. Keep in mind, we tested with a 1080 Ti. We can step down to a GTX 1070, and these differences that you see between the 8400 and the Ryzen 5 2600 and the X5675, they'll even become that much insignificant to the point where it's not gonna make a difference at all. Though of course, as much sentimental value as X58 has and the hype that I do here on the channel for it, going new is what most people will want to do. You've got your new features like USB front out header, PCIe 3.0, RGB lighting a lot of the times. Not only that, you've got more power efficiency and warranty available if parts break down. Generally with used parts, you only get a couple of months because that's what you paid for on eBay or you paid for on PayPal, but if you're getting local deals, a lot of the time you've got no warranty at all. So you do the, run that risk. But one thing that I've never talked about before with X58, and one thing that does make it kind of even more special is the fact that a lot of people bought X58 motherboards with the i7-920, and that's a four core, eight threaded part, and they didn't overclock at all. And so these motherboards have been babied their whole life. And I will say one thing about most X58 motherboards, they were built phenomenally well. They were built to handle six cores, 12 threads, overclocked. So if you find one and it's a good price, I'd generally snap it up. That would be my advice with the Westmere six core, 12 threaded Xeons on those X58 motherboards. They did surprise me, they are still relevant. So if people do call them irrelevant, I want you guys to point them to this video here because they can still get up and boogie in 2018, even if you're streaming, even if you're playing games with a 1080 Ti. Though ultimately, if it's one thing to come out of today's video, it's that I don't think CPUs have come that far at all in the last 10 years. In fact, a lot of these power efficiency improvements that you're seeing have probably come from the fact that we've gone from 45 nanometer down to 32 nanometer in the case of the Westmere CPUs, then down to 22 nanometer and down to 14 nanometer on Intel's side of things. Ryzen 2600 is now on 12 nanometer too, so that's where you're going to get a lot of those power saving features from. In terms of raw architectural improvements, I don't think we've seen a whole lot, as opposed to the GPU side of things, when Nvidia, for example, went from Kepler to Maxwell, I thought there was a massive difference in power efficiency and also that enabled them to then extract more gains. Anyway, if you enjoyed today's video, then be sure to hit that like button and let me know in the comment section below what you think of six cores versus six cores versus eight year old six core architecture. Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that sub button with email notifications turned on if you want the latest videos dropping in your inbox from Tech yes City. And also if you want to support the channel a step further, then there is the option to support us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. You gain access to behind the scenes footage and also Patreon live streams, which I do with tech deals over at his channel. So I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Thanks for watching. Peace out for now. Bye.